to the April work session of the Borough of Gettysburg. Uh, just a few announcements before we begin. An executive session of the Borough Council of the Borough of Gettysburg was conducted immediately following the adjournment of the April 10th, 2023 monthly mail business meeting of the Council, consistent with Section 708A1 and Section 708A5 of the Sunshine Act for the following purposes. <coughs> discuss matters involving the employment and the terms and conditions of employment of the borough employees, and two, to review and discuss matters of borough business which, if conducted in public, could lead to disclosure of information on matters of confidentiality protected by law. All right, so we'll be moving to public comment. Our first session uh, is for items that are on the agenda, you know, Racehorse Alley, uh, the employee manual, and the uh, Adams County Historical Society Trail Feasibility Study or the only this evening. Uh, pardon me, a speeding concern on Fourth Street. So, uh, if you'd like to make public comment, uh, I invite you to please use the uh, podium with the microphone, give us your name, address, and limit yourself to five minutes. Okay. <laughs> Hello this evening. My name's Susan Noggle. My address is 650 Red Patch Avenue here in Gettysburg. First of all, I want to thank this council for your continuing support of the Gettysburg Interloop. It's been a long road with this. You're tackling one of the most difficult sections uh, probably on the western side of the, of the loop. And I appreciate your thoughtfulness in, in taking a look at how we can make this happen. First of all, uh, the approach that we've always had to the Gettysburg Interloop has always been to make the most of it for the community. So where you see uh, the Interloop, uh, the trail completed, you'll see trees, you'll see greenery, you see a beautiful br bridge that connects um, uh, the community in ways that we uh, didn't really anticipate. You see benches, trash cans, you see historic markers, you see lighted crosswalks and, and lighting along the trail, and you see stormwater, where we tried to incorporate stormwater improvements wherever we could in the trail. So we tried to make the most of the grants that we had. Racehorse Alley is a challenge. There really isn't any other choice for where we connect the loop to the downtown and to businesses, uh, to lodging, to restaurants. Um, and I think that's mainly because of the railroad. We have very few crossings that, that go across. So um, the approach should be the same to that, make the most of it. So when we talked about this and planned for this, uh, we talked about lighting for safety because there have been some crime in that alleyway. Benches, trash cans to keep it clean, lighted crosswalk, and discussions about art. And we also, in 2014 got a grant from the Chesapeake Bay Trust to design stormwater improvements for the western end of uh, the, um, the alley. Uh, that's prone to flooding and stormwater issues, so uh, we wanted to make the most of that. It's, all that requires space, so <laughs> it's hard to, to fit everything in there that we need to. I do want to mention something. There's been discussion about moving the parking spots from Washington Street to the alley. Uh, just so you know, when we were planning this, that was done at the request of the college. They wanted to maintain some parking so students could come in and out, move in and out, and other needs that they have in, in the uh, dorms that are there at the Ice House. Critical goals for this to think about, first of all, is safety. It needs to be as safe as it can be for uh, families on bikes, for pedestrians, for novice cyclers in order to get them downtown. Uh, I think that's probably the prime thing that you need to think about as you look at the options. Create opportunity. We always looked at what we can do to improve the community overall. It needs to be, it can be transformative if you look at it in that way. We are a half a block off the business district. There would be opportunities there for businesses on that alley, for revitalizing the properties that are there. So all of that can be achieved with some forethought and some planning. 
um, reduce the traffic. You know, I think that's another main goal. It's, it's an alley, it's not a street, and the borough shouldn't be encouraging or facilitating through traffic on a regular basis on any of our alleys, not just this one. Which option? <laughs> I've looked, I've heard Chad's presentations. Um, this is a difficult decision. I'm not going to make a recommendation. I think your borough engineer has done a lot of work uh, to come up with some viable options. None of them are perfect, unfortunately. So I think, you know, I, I just think maybe just take his ad advice on what's going to work, look at the pros and cons, and I trust this council to make the best decision on this. Uh, look at the maximum for safety. Think about transformation and how you can accomplish that using this grant in that, in that alley, looking to the future. Think out of the box. This is not just about bicycles. This is an opportunity to really do something more in our downtown community uh, that will benefit the whole community as a whole. And you're never going to solve the traffic problems. You know, you're always going to be dealing with that. I don't think that should be a prime consideration for this um, as, as we have these growth in the outlying uh, areas. It's not going to get any better, unfortunately, uh, but uh, I think you have an opportunity here to really make something special with getting this loop to the downtown. So thank you very much and good luck with this. <laughs> you're, and you're always going to have complaint. You're never going to make people happy. You all know that now. So. <laughs> what? Hi there. <clears throat> Tom Jolin, 249 Ridge Avenue, Gettysburg. <coughs> and I am only going to be up here to thank you for your work. <laughs> I know it seems strange, doesn't it? But <laughs> it is, oh, oftentimes don't get comments like that. But I watched you work deep into the night many a time. And it's uh, sometimes on film and sometimes in person. It's very, very impressive. And we're very lucky to have you. I do have my opinions about how it should be handled. I'm. Um, yeah, kind of echoing what Susan said, I think it's more than transportation, it's redevelopment of that whole area which really needs it. And um, with that, I'm not going to take up more time. Thank you and for your, so much for your work. Anyone else for public comment? Okay, seeing none, we will uh, move on to old business. Our first item is the Racehorse Alley one way discussion. Mr. Playball. So, President Heiser, you, you've heard my presentation now twice. I don't intend to go through the whole thing again unless you want me to. Um, so I think we're kind of just going to jump right past that. It's the same presentation that I have on the overhead here tonight that's, that was in your council packets as, as, as what you've seen a couple of times this year and in April of last year. So I think maybe the best thing to do is I'll just jump right to the slide here that shows This is the one-way west option that kind of mimics that, also that no turn left. It would do essentially the same thing. So I'll just use this for an exhibit for our discussion purposes. Um, but really, I, th I think at this point, I don't want to waste any more of your time by me talking. I think it's more about you guys um, further deliberating. I'll, I'll just remind you that uh, we still don't need to have an answer tonight. Um, we we uh, would like to have an answer by no later than July. That's that's our goal here, midsummer, um, so that we can move forward and be ready to, for our our goal is to go to construction next year because we have a deadline for some CDBG money. So um, we do have another couple of months yet that we can further deliberate if we need it. Um, but I think I'll go ahead and pass it to you guys, and I'm here for answering questions if you have them. Right, yeah, so let's go ahead. Mr. Claybaugh, would you, just for the purpose of our 
um, the public who's here tonight and those at home that might be watching. Could, could we go back to the, just so you can explain a little bit about the um, transformation, what it would look like, the before and after picture. I think that's important for people to see. Yep, and then we had two before and after pictures. Oh. Um, so this is the one on the alley itself. Um, the, the pictures on the left are the before. The one on the top is just a picture of the alley. The one on the bottom left is two cars trying to pass each other. That's pretty common on that alley. Um, and then the one on the right is what we hope or, or envision it could look like. Uh, with some type of a paver surface, um, the lights, some greenery. Um, there would there would be a, a stormwater management component to the paver system as well in, on this particular section. Um, there would be a permeable paver. That's what Susan was sent, saying that we got the um, Chesapeake Bay grant to, to design. Having received that grant, we are, it's incumbent upon us to, to to take those measures, right? Yeah, I mean, I've never seen them come back and say, hey, we gave you this money to design this. This has right. been probably five years ago, and hey, we want our money back now. Right. Do I see that happening? I, I don't necessarily see that happening, but I think it's it's in faith that they gave us that money, that we've completed that design, that they're going to want to mm -hmm. see something happen. If we just did nothing there with that, mm -hmm. that would probably not be in good faith. So well, we would need to do something for water management. I mean, grant or not, that area, if we don't put in permeable pavement, that's kind of like the... It's sort of almost a low-hanging fruit option. We need to yeah. do that, right, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. <clears throat> to be very direct, if that apartment complex hadn't been split up into condominiums, the Stormwater Authority could consider taking that, mm -hmm. purchasing that. Now, as it's been split into condominiums, it's really impractical to do that. But that mm -hmm. self-mill apartment complex is just a disaster waiting to happen. And we, well, it happened, mm -hmm. yeah. right? Yeah. So, like, we're just waiting for round two. Um, because as the water comes up, it it's literally flows underneath the building. Mm -hmm. um, so this is kind of like the, the least we can do style option to me. If you can't put down asphalt again and expect that to to help at all. Mm -hmm. right. And then the second, the next slide here is just on Washington Street. This is a before and after. This is kind of irrelevant to the discussion of the one-way alley, mm -hmm. um, but it does go with the parking discussion. You can see in this picture here, um, there's parking that exists on Washington Street. Right. We'd be looking to eliminate that parking and move it to right. the alley. Um, so I just wanted to show you that as well. Well, even even if um, it was not accessible for bicycles, bicyclists, it's not accessible the way it is right now. It's correct. It's not even ADA accessible for pedestrians. Right, right. Or someone in a wheelchair, it's not accessible at this all. This little space that you have right here right. is supposed to be a minimum of four feet, and I think right. it's just over two. Right. All right. M members of the happy, oh, mem many members of the happy board are here this evening, so I think and as a member of the Happy Board, I'd be interested in all of your thoughts and comments. So, what you think about this? Well, I'll, I'll start if nobody else wants to. I really like the funnel um, option. I think if we have one-way traffic going in either direction, either east to west or west to east, at some point during the day, we're still encouraging several hundred cars to use this as a shortcut. Um, the sort of um, great thing about the funnel is it really <laughs> discourages you from driving on there unless you have to. Um, being uh, kind of shunted onto Franklin and having to sit at that light is is not ideal and you're not going to take that shortcut if, if you are forced to do that. So it would really reduce traffic just to residents and um, access for the businesses. Uh, uh, I think it has the most bang for our buck in terms of creating a bicycle and pedestrian thoroughfare while still maintaining access for all those homes and businesses. That's, that's where I'm at. <coughs> um, at the la last time we discussed this, some, someone on council, I can't remember who, asked, has one of the businesses, was it Members First? been uh, contacted about the public building? Still not yet. Still not yet. Okay. 
mean, I'll say it, I said it last month. I'll say it again. I think that the funnel design is probably one of the most impractical traffic patterns I've ever seen. I can appreciate why it's done, um, but the purpose there really is to eliminate all traffic from the alley, uh, if at all possible. And I can understand that objective, um, but I cannot favor that objective. I think it has to be a balance between uh, the competing goals. If I had to choose a singular, it would be one way west, just because, again, of the impracticality of turning left on the Washington Street and turning left onto the alley to begin with. Um, and again, those parking spaces, one way or not, in the alley, I would get rid of those for visibility sight lines. Um, if you're coming in there on a bicycle like that, to me, that's having biked that many, many times, that's the worst spot, mm -hmm. is right when you go in there. Coming off of Washington Street. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's the worst to me. So if there were parking spaces there, you're saying that would be, yeah, you'd have so doors opening. Of, yeah, like anything, cars. anything with the exception of maybe a small sedan, you're going to have an obstructed sight line on a bicycle. And a high potential for somebody on a bicycle getting doored. That's possible, too. Yeah. So you favor the west, this one right here? That's what I favor. Just from a practicality standpoint, if you're on a vehicle, in a vehicle, and you go into that alley, you're making a right-hand turn. If you're on a bicycle and you're going to that alley, you're making a right-hand turn. Um, it, I mean, I guess we talked about, right, like except bikes could go eastbound, and I'm okay with that too. Um, you know, to, not to admit on television that I break the law, but there are places in the park service land that I go opposite on a bicycle for short periods because of practicality issues. Hopefully Joe's not watching that. It's going to ticket me. We asked the chief about that. If we do do a one-way, can bicycles still go? I, to I'm opposed to bicycles. I, as I said before, I'm opposed to bicycles going against the direction of traffic. Um, it, I, I think that you're opening up a can of worms there. People are going to see it there, and even though that's an exception to the rule, you're going to have people do it in other places and, and thinking it's all right. And, and I, I just I, I can see an issue with the bikes going the wrong way unless we had a dedicated portion for bicycles that was a bicycle path, and then 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 I don't have issue with it. But to to be on the the street or the roadway as defined by the vehicle code and going the wrong way, you're you're going to have to write an ordinance that opposes the vehicle code as well yeah. um, <clears throat> for one way traffic. And uh, I'm just I I'm. I'm not a fan of allowing bicycles to go against the posted direction of traffic. Well, I, I think the problem we have here is that no matter which model, model we take, at, at that choke point there, right west of Franklin Street, at some point or another, a bicycle is always going against the oncoming traffic. If there's traffic allowed to go one way or either way, we're always going to have that issue on this alley because we can't make it any wider there. But there's two choke points. There's one. The one that Mr. Moon was talking about is this one, just west of Franklin Street. This is Franklin Street. But there's also this piece right here, and we talked to the college again about uh, potentially acquiring some right-of-way there, and again, they said no, and they're not interested in providing any. So it's kind of two choke points. So you'd have a point, like if you were on a, a bicycle, um, you know, if it was one way or the other way, let's just think about this uh, to, for my discussion purposes. If you were on a bicycle, heading um, west when you get to this point right here you'd have to basically yield to the oncoming traffic to get to that point so we could have signs i mean there are wait places where you could have a contra flow lane a designated lane to a certain distance and then to a point where it narrows down to where you've got to yield to oncom oncoming traffic there is places like that there's bridges there's you, you can think about it driving around. You could, you know, a, sometimes a bridge underneath of a railroad that isn't wide enough, and then it says you have to yield to incoming traffic, and one person has to go, then the other person has to go. So you'd have signage like that for those kind of things, but it would be it would be wonky for sure. <clears throat> can those contraflow lanes simply be a painted line? So I'm what are working on trying to get some more information on that. I have my design team looking into <coughs> it. Um, it, it. It depends on if you follow America's standards or European standards, and that's what we're starting to find now. When you start to, to do the research on these things, in Europe, uh, bicycling is a little bit more prevalent. 
uh, and you see a lot of streets where it's one way and bikes go either way because there's a significant amount more bikes on the road so they kind of do their own thing um, in, in the, the PA code in the, the Federal Highway Administration manual everything that we could find in America suggests that there's some type of a vertical separation separating the contraflow lane from the bikes which becomes a nightmare for the Public Works Department because now you got this four or five foot wide contraflow lane that you can't fit a snow plow down. All right, plowing. Yeah. Jeez. Would it be possible to sign it with cyclists must dismount and walk? I don't a joke point? Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't see the point of doing any of this work if you have to get off your bicycle. Uh, and that's a problem I've had with the engineering on phase one as well. Uh, where we have lighted crosswalks on Middle Street and Buford in order to actually signal that you want to cross. You actually have to get off your bicycle and get onto the sidewalk to do that. That is not creating a practical commuter path for bicycles. Um, well, there on Buford, you're just on the sidewalk. But to cross it, to cross at Reynolds, you have to get off your bicycle walk up onto the sidewalk to come the other way to okay, trigger yeah, yeah. the button sorry 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 I'm thinking yeah. One. Yeah. oh yeah sorry crossing east I typically go the other way um, I, I, I personally again I, you know I'm just to just to echo I think the argument that the the vehicle traffic is what makes this so tricky to engineer is a great reason to eliminate as much vehicle traffic as possible and this is really just two very short thin blocks out of all of the roadscapes in Gettysburg that we would be um, trying to create a safer space for pedestrians and bicycles. Um, <coughs> the, uh, you know, everywhere else, you, you know, the, the cars are still kings here. So, um, I think if we're going to spend this, we need to make it um, accessible to people on foot and on wheels. So let me throw this out here. <clears throat> Last month, I, I provided you all with a, a scoring criteria sheet with uh, five options. And the second highest scoring there was um, simply add a sign that says no left turn from the alley to North Washington Street. So if you're headed east on the alley, there would be a note left, there would be a, a sign right here that says no left turns. Essentially what that would do would eliminate all of the through traffic that heads eastbound. It would still allow people to go eastbound, but it would eliminate through traffic heading eastbound. So it would do almost the same thing as the one-way west option. Not quite to the same extent because you would still have a little bit of traffic, you know, to your local traffic coming in and out of here. Um, but if there was no left turn here, you wouldn't have all of the people that are coming through and just trying to make that through. Okay. If you just simply put that sign in, uh, I'm not sure I'd like to hear from the folks from Havi if that if they feel like that's making it safe enough if that really serves the goal or the intent of making this safe for bikes and pedestrian but if you but if you did that um, that wouldn't become then a conflict for the contraflow lane because essentially you're still allowing two-way traffic you just if you're a car you can't turn left and bikes would be able to turn still turn left because at that point there's going to be a trail here What's the speed limit on Racehorse Alley? Is it 20? 25? They're all 25 on side. Yeah, throughout the borough. I'm just wondering if lowering the speed limit also on the alleys. 25 seems really fast, from, in my opinion, for alleys. I don't know what the police chief thinks about that. Cautionary at that point. Yeah, it, it, would, be, yeah, it, it would be a cautionary speed limit at that point. I agree with you, 100%. Yeah, yeah. 25, you can, you're going 25 that alley, you're going way too fast. Uh, right. But uh, as Chad said, it can only be a cautionary speed limit, even with a proper traffic. Twenty-five is the, min the minimum speed, speed limit. So if you post anything less than that, it's technically not enforceable. Um, but there are some vehicles. When we did the traffic counts here, the county did years ago that that do over twenty-five. Believe it or oh, not, yeah. on that, I see that them. western block. This block, you don't have that speed issue, but this side you do. And one of the things that is um, contemplated. It, depending on what we come up with here is a, is a speed bump. Speed bump, like they put on East Broadway. Table, I'll call it a table, yeah. Speed table, right, yeah. It's like Broadway. Which what, definitely works. Well, what effect would that have for the bikes, anything? I, I'm not a 
Catch some sick air. Tell you (laughs) right. (laughs) Catch some sick air. From what I understand about it, the tables don't have the. That it's not the same as a, a bump or a hump. Yeah, yeah. Right. the tables are a little bit. And it doesn't go all the way out to the edge of the street, too. I think, right? Doesn't um, it? It might have to on this oh, okay. case because it's only 12 feet. It'd be like a mogul on a bicycle. It'd yeah. be kind of fun. No, I don't know what my colleagues would think about that. I'm happy, but it's not the most fun to go over, but it's doable, right? A, a speed hump really kind of jarred it. Table's not. Table's not as jarring. Yeah. It's only four inches high, spread over eight feet. Is well, I feel like I'm a little bit of a tough spot. Um, philosophically, I agree with Habby, and I thank the board for showing up. What your goals are with walkability and and bicycling. Um, Saying it's a shortcut, that's putting it one way. I, I guess my, my caution is since our built-in environment in town, we don't have many east-west arteries for traffic, um, that there could be too much traffic on Chambersburg Street. And I just worry um, for safety and just you know, tourist season and, and uh, I could see citizen complaints and um, as much as you know you talked about balancing these things I I, if I would have to to pick a one way I probably would do the West Um, but I don't know what council members think about you know the possibility of increased traffic and how much of a problem that's going to be well uh, Chad spoke to that at the last workshop he he gave us the numbers from the traffic study uh, be adding roughly 300 cars to the commute which is something like 10 to 15,000 a day Uh, I guess PennDOT's opinion was that that was not significant that was in November though too which it would be yeah. different in June, July. I'm not really convinced that the tourists are taking these alleys, though. Like, I think they're probably following their GPS to get around, and it is not telling them to take narrow alleys that's, that that's may that's or may point. not it's be not one about, way. That's my point. The, the locals use the alley, not necessarily for a shortcut, but because it gets backed up a lot sure. during those times. Sure. And, you know, and I try to go the different ways and try to but I just worry that we need to think about the possibility that there could be way too much traffic on chambers um, yeah I, what would you say about that mr. Heiser well, there's Do only you have three, the same words there's or? only three east-west routes that go the whole way Chambers Street Middle Street and Racehorse Hill that's it yeah. So it's difficult with the geography uh, between the railroad and the national park. That's the deal. I mean, that's that's so true of so many things in this borough, um, right? You know, the blessing and curse of uh, you know the national park, and the same with the railroad. I mean, you only get so many crossings. Uh, it would be nice if there was a crossing somewhere towards the upper end of Buford Avenue, but there just isn't. Uh, so it does create a problem. Uh, I, I do think it's locals that are going to use this. I, I've been kind of surprised not to get a lot of feedback in that regard. Um, I got some before our initial meeting. I have not heard anything this past month directly uh, about the option, which surprised me. I think that you know a lot of people would be surprised when it, if it were to change and when that happens. Mm-hmm. Right. And that's the unfortunate part about it. Right. You're going to get feedback after it's all complete, despite the you know, a variety of uh, publications that have covered it, you know, the publicity now. I agree with Mr. Moon. I like the Franklin Funnel personally. Um, I think it needs to, um, I think our borough needs to be more inviting and welcoming to pedestrians and bicycles. Um, that alley is very small. I do not like when cars go onto my property through an alley you need to stay in the alley not go into somebody's private property just to pass so this might limit that from happening a little bit and help that 
at the same time as helping bicycles and pedestrians. I like the Franklin Funnel. When um, I drove it today, I was in anticipation of this discussion, I was struck by two things that I did not know before. The people who live along the alley facing the other way, but they use that for parking. And I'm curious how many of those landlords use that as a selling point. Rent this place and you get a parking place back there. Sure. Um, what about the apartments at the corner of Buford? And is that Silk Mill? Yeah, or Creekside, yeah. Creekside, I guess, is the and, property, yeah. um, their entrance into their parking is limited if, if we do not allow them to go both ways. Well, the funnel design does allow for two-way traffic up to the parking lot of the Silk Mill. <coughs> Here's right the funnel. There, so one works, of the yeah. things that we considered, if it's one way east, it works to allow two-way uh, with a very minor right of way adjustment here at this at this intersection so we think we should we should be able to obtain even without the right of way keep it the way it is basically but you can obtain a proper two lane in uh, with a minor right of way um, but you should be able to with the front funnel or the east you should be able to have two lanes in and out of the, the creekside apartments the size for one way west would be difficult and that's I, the issue. I do Patty. agree with Patty that it's, it's really good that we're looking at stormwater in that area at the same time. If you all remember our 100-year flood a few years ago just wiped out those apartments. Um, the water came up and uh, the apartments went down. So it is a, a factor to consider also. And the final point I wanted to make is I crossed Franklin heading east, a um, lot of parking along there, parallel parking, and it's really hard to see. If you're going to scoot across Franklin, it's hard to see particularly to the left. But uh, luckily I have good brakes on my car and I avoided hitting that college vehicle that came mm -hmm. zooming along Franklin. Um, so. Well, and there's a light there too, so that at, at Franklin and Chambersburg, so people going out would would stop there. After our discussion tonight, I'd like to drive it again, mm -hmm. taking into consideration things that have been said tonight. But not on the way home tonight. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think he said no change, right? Clear majority. Yeah, no, John would leave it to him. So it seems that we need to, people need to ponder and think about this because it'll be a close decision, I believe. All right, what I would uh, ask you to consider are which options you would find acceptable. Let's find and prioritize them, but also consider what you would find acceptable if you're trying to find a consensus here in Okay. Given the information we've been provided, I, I think we're at a point where it's time to to make a decision so that Mr. Clayball can get things moving. It's it just doesn't seem that there's a lot more to be discovered here. We all know the challenges. We all know the balances. We can you know create data points to articulate it, but the reality is is that we know none of these options is. This not will set her to be perfect. So be prepared in May to make a decision of what to push forward. Uh, because something has to go forward. But right now I'm looking at you know roughly three three. You know, let's see if there's peace we can find that we have a, a majority on. I know that Mr. Clayball at our previous meeting talked about how they were ranked in the order. Could you just go over that again, sure. please? Sure. Uh, and the I'll give you the criteria that I ranked it on yep. and then um, the, the, the ranking. So they were uh, 
the Gettysburg College Facility Services, the Creekside Apartments, safety at Racehorse, Washington and Street intersections, uh, parking spaces relocated to the alley from Washington, impact to Washington, sig the Washington signal uh, for the stacking focus, concern with contraflow lane, safety for pedestrians, bikes, and least amount of through traffic, and uh, the change to through traffic impact to the Route 30 signals, and uh, if it's confusing or um, awkward signage. So ranking all of those things, the Franklin Funnel came, had the highest um, score at 32. Um, that idea with that signage for the no left turn uh, only came second with 30. One way west was third for 28. One way east was uh, fourth with 22. And then the Franklin centrifuge, that would be the opposite of the funnel, uh, was the lowest ranking at 20. Thank you. Okay. Other discussion points or pieces of input about the alley? This juncture. All right, if not, I guess we're going to go on to the employee policy manual. Last month, Council looked at the first three chapters of uh, the updated employee manual. Um, Labor Council um, Campbell Durant has looked at those and has signed off on those final versions. Uh, so uh, if, if Council would like, we'll just look at those very briefly today and see if there's any final edits that Council would be interested in. Uh, if not, we'll put those aside and move on to uh, Chapter 4. Okay, let's just go chapter by chapter here. Does anyone have any final edits for chapter one? This is the introduction. No. I did not see anything, but now is the time. Are you ready to move on to chapter two? Yep. Chapter two is your organizational structure for the manual. I think the biggest thing that we had here was the uh, review schedule for it, which will coincide with the uh, renewal of contracts, collective bargaining agreements, or MOUs. Any additions on chapter two or questions, clarification? If there are none, seeing anybody, we'll go to chapter three. So in chapter three, you'll notice there were a number of additions of relatively minor strips of property or rights of way that the uh, borough has on its uh, listing, as well as a few properties, well, I guess one property that we lease, which is the uh, county line. yellow strip of land for plowing. I thought we had talked about adding the fill site. That's a good point. You are correct. Uh, <coughs> so in chapter 3, we need to add the fill site of the pipe. make sure we have that that little chunk next to the parking garage too so that's uh 74 no that's the garage that should be 30 to 32 north Stratton street got it got it that's the rear yard i would think yep Any other uh, alterations to Chapter 3? 
It's just facilities of the borough. It's all the various places where we would think that employees would be engaged to work on a regular basis. All right, we go to chapter four. Um, I'm gonna pick up where we left off. We left off just before 4.5. Fair to this is not the Labor Council yet, though. It has not. Right. Labor Council has looked at it, but um, we'll wait for Council to finalize it, and they'll look at it in its right. final so draft. We, we had noted some items in Chapter 4 that will be reviewed, but at this point, we can start at 4.5 and allow Labor Council and uh, HR to take a look at those. So this is the uh, section on medical examinations. This entire area being related to the Americans with Disabilities Act. So you did see some changes in those previous areas. Right person first, um, focus language, first language, and so forth. All right, any uh, items that people have identified with 4.5? Four point six. Um, the note I had in here was that this should probably be broken out into a different section, right? This is not an ADA. Yeah, I think we're of mind to create an, so a separate chapter that, for ethics and a code of ethics chapter. This is, yeah, this is something that'll come back before our final look. So just understand that while four point six sits here right now, <coughs> the contents we would expect, unless we alter them to stay the same mm -hmm. or similar, uh, this will probably become part of a new chapter because it's about ethics and conflicts of interest. That would include like the financial disclosure and whistleblower and all of that? Yeah, there's a whole segment here right. that really right. is, I made a note, 4.6 through I think 4.9. Right. That just seems like it begs to be part of something mm -hmm. different. Yeah. Um, that has nothing to do with the ADA. Yeah. All right, so as they're numbered, uh, 4.6 is our ethics and conflicts of interest section. Right, and uh, we get kind of a lengthy breakdown here of activities prohibited. That's 4.6.1. Right, conflicts of interest under item A, and a lot of this really mirrors uh, state law and so forth and guidance. Accepting gifts or for improper influence. I guess it's or improper if I was trying to decide if it should be for or over. So, it should be accepting gifts for improper influence or accepting gifts for improper influence. They're both the same sentiment. Right. You could say it either way. C handles contracts and purchasing. So any questions for 4.6 and 4.6.1? All right, if not 4.6.2 is your final financial disclosure. Side note, if you have not turned in your financial disclosures, <laughs> <laughs> they are due by May 1st. It is awfully close to May 1st. All right, but this is essentially that, you know, employees are required to disclose anything that would cause a conflict or could potentially cause a conflict, even if no actual conflict exists. All right, if there are no questions, uh, 4.7, whistleblowing. And 
And I would point out here again that the language here heavily relies on federal, state, local laws, rules, right. and regulations. So that's something to important to understand about whistleblowing. That protection applies if someone in good faith is reporting such a violation. It's not necessarily a blanket. Yeah, so the only note of consequence here was a discussion as to whether um, these matters would be referred to the HRC. Um, I don't believe that this would be the purview of the HRC. Labor Council has the same assessment. That was a question asked of them. So I would strike that. So you're saying it should not go to the human relations? It doesn't. It's not in yeah. their purview. In their purview. I wondered about that, too. Yeah, I think that there's a, a whistleblower circumstance. It's that's a very serious matter, right? right? So you're probably almost immediately potentially going to court action if there is an act that is committed to violate that person's rights. Right. We wouldn't be mediating a, a whistleblower situation. Right. No, like if someone has blown the whistle and they are wrong, they have been wrong, then there's really no, especially as this applies to the government, right? You're talking about another employee or, or a portion of the government, you know, taking action against the employee. Circumstance. All right. Questions or uh, otherwise about four point seven. <coughs> so, what yes. would replace the uh, HRC then? That would be would it be the solicitor? If, I'm just wondering yeah. if it were the manager, for example. Fair. Uh, yeah, that is Fair a good point. question. Okay. Yeah, we could restructure that to, actually, I'm not sure that it specifies the who right here. Perhaps it should. Right, normally this is something you'd expect the manager to handle pretty directly right. with HR. Uh, mm -hmm. If it were the manager, I think that then you'd have the it reminds me kind of what we created with the uh, complaint procedure, your right. uh, assistant manager in HR. Well, I think in this case, um, would, you'd go to the manager's supervisor, which would be and or president yeah. of council. Council. Yeah. So I'm thinking how that language is set up. There, there's a, a very interesting series of arrangements that have to exist because of the manager and his role compared to everyone else and then also you have the issue with the police department and how that is all operated and manipulated so um, Harry can you clarify if I'm wrong here but I believe all decisions having to do with the hiring firing or discipline of the manager would be the purview of council that is correct so I would think it would yeah. go to the president of council yeah, I think we may have language Yeah, so let's let's mirror what we did in the uh, the complaint policy. So in the event that this is lodged against the manager, the subsequent uh, investigation will be conducted by the assistant borough manager, the borough human resources director, the president of council, and vice president of council. Let's just mirror the same exact language. That way, it's consistent and that seems appropriate. You don't just have a single elected official involved. Right. And council would be involved in that in terms of in terms of an advisory role, right? Yeah. Right. I yeah. think that if something like this happened, yeah. there'd be deliberation. Did. Right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. You would have executive yeah. sessions and there would yeah. be action taken because what you're talking about is either the right. reality or accusation right. that someone violated a whistleblower's protection, which are again a very yeah. severe situation to be to find yourself in. In that same 
complaint policy we had written in that the complaint were lodged against the chief of police, the investigation should be conducted by the mayor, the manager, and the human resources director, and I think that would right. be appropriate also. Right. That way it's losing it does not exclude uh, his direct supervisor. Right? But it would be the mayor and the president of borough council if it were the police, right? Well, in our in our complaint policy, if it were yeah. the chief of police, right. it's the mayor, borough manager, human resources director. Um, we also have a a provision for both the assistant manager and the human resources director because they can't sit on their own. Right investigation. But the chief of police has a, a layer of supervision right. between council and him. So. Right, because yeah. borough council is the one that hires and fires if necessary, right? Yeah. Yep. And one of the things here is I look over that complaint policy. So the when we're dealing with complaints, the police department has its own complaint policy and follows that policy. And then the remainder of the employees fall underneath uh, an investigation by the manager, assistant manager, and human resources. Sure. <laughs> yep. So we probably should look at that language and see how that would all line up. Yeah. Right. It, it should it should line up and be the same. So <coughs> right. we need to look at that employee uh, pardon me, the uh, the police department complaint policy and makes let's make this all match. Um, the other issue, right, that we have there, those are civil service employees, but I don't think that that would right. uh, cause a difference at this stage of the right. the circumstance. Yeah, we need to make a note. We need to look at that and how that would function it's without having more in front of me I can't really speak well to it mm. uh, sorry we already passed 4.6 did is there a reason why 4.6 and 4.7 is under the ADA chapter we're gonna move them. yeah we're, we're gonna move moving it. they're all this it's, is all moving to a separate section why it was there yeah, thank you We'll have to put some language together and bring it back because it's just, it's a lot to match through right now. Yeah, we'll, we'll come up with a draft and return that right. in May. Because there are a lot of odd little circumstances there and we did not address in this who, and it really should, right? They should be able to look at this and say, all right, this is where we go. Yeah, yeah, this uh, is what's going to happen. That's not a time to sort that type of thing out. Right. right. I would agree. Okay, so that's, that's a good catch with how that all is. And, and I think you've highlighted that there's a really natural intersection here between the transparency and complaint policy. And I would think so, right? Yeah. Who, yeah, who actually deals with the hands-on portion of that. All right, so we'll understand that we'll be revisiting 4.7 to deal with those items. Are there other uh, questions or comments about 4.7, which is our whistleblowing policy? All right, 4.8 deals with recruitment and hiring. Just bonafide, I think, needs another I in there, right? It does have that. Just a minor little. I didn't have any specific items for 4.8.1, 2 or 3. Does anyone yeah. have any? No. It was right. really just formatting stuff. Okay. Um, I had put in a question, uh, 4.8.1, the last bullet point, failure to conform to the aforementioned requirements. No, I'm sorry, that's not it. Where is it? I'm sorry, it's the next section, uh, 4.8.2. Uh, length application is active. Okay, so we have a time frame in there. 
Yeah, Matt, yeah, your question year. was how long you should retain applications on file. Yeah. And uh, per the Civil Rights Act of 1964, it is one year. Great. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that seems like a you logical really don't way to, to address keep them it. past a year because after that, then the likelihood that if you were to pull from that file, then you'll actually, actually call someone who's interested yeah. drops off dramatically. Right. Okay. All right, that takes us to 4.9, examination of applicants. Just real quick on that point about the applications being kept for a year, even though I know uniform police are civil service. Yep. Is that going to have any effect on being able to extend that list for a two-year period? Just technically now you're keeping police applications on file for two years with respect to civil service list. I don't think it would because it's a list. So your application period is closed and you've generated a list, so you're really just extending the list. Okay. So I think we're okay. That's a good question though. I yeah, I did no, I thought about the same thing in my head and I'm like, All I mean, right, well, you, you push it to the civil I mean I hate to use the term push it, but it's pushed to the Civil Service Commission anyway, so it, it um, yeah. and it's governed by their regulations, but I thought I'd ask it while we were there. Yeah. yeah. No, no, it's a good question because it really is though about the list rather than a a bank of applications. The one issue that will come up is if you're hiring off that list later, you are going to rely on those application materials, so there's no scenario where they can be discarded. And when you're trying to do your backgrounds and so forth, that's that's your, your later step problems that you'd have to make sure that that's all maintained. You have to make sure that's all maintained. It's just a little different than any other area of the borough. Yeah. Do we need to include that language? You could put it under 4.8.3 under the Uniform Police Personnel if you wanted to keep the applications open for two years. Then we can make a note in there. The material should be maintained as long as the list remains active. Okay. That will yeah. solve in case yeah. there were some sort of later amendment to the civil service laws or something of that nature. You're, you don't have to change it. That's a good catch. Thank you, Chief. <laughs> All right, and that takes us to your uh, examinations under four point nine. Uh, so I had to ask a question there. There's a, a line that is struck through uh, about notification of counsel as to these applications, uh, but I'm wondering if we need language there for the positions that counsel participates in the hiring of, for example, the manager uh, and secretary, et cetera. That's a provision in the borough code. There are direct hires that the council makes, chief of police, secretary, and treasurer. This council has chosen that the manager is the treasurer and the secretary is the assistant manager. Yeah, I mean, I think otherwise. Some, some, in some cases, one person can do both. If John were here, he would tell you that, right, there's a difference between a borough council running a borough government and a borough council with a manager. Right. right. And there are some forms in the room from the borough code, and I think he would point that out if he were here. Uh, it's certainly something that could be considered, but it's it, it starts to become a little bit difficult in terms of hiring people, I think, when you're uh, – going back and forth with the approval for that. I definitely wouldn't consider it anything below department head. Thoughts about that? 
They may think council should be involved with the review and approval of department heads or anything beyond that which is in the borough code, which would be the man, basically the manager, the treasurer, so, the treasurer, so, secretary, chief of police. So uh, correct me if I'm wrong on this, solicitor. The reference in the borough code there is the advice and consent of the council as it relates to the duties and, and authorizations of the manager. But certainly we've had council members involved in searches before. I always include, whenever we do a, a department head interview, I've always included members of council in that, yes. Yeah. I mean, they've often been involved in searches. We've also had hires where we found out after the fact. That certainly happened to me. And I was surprised. But the one piece of irritation that I hold against Charles. <laughs> There were borough council members involved in that process. Right. But, and it was authorized by budgeting. But we hired two people, and we had one position that became two positions. And that's when we hired planning director and it's the uh, director of environmental preservation. <coughs> Vice president of council, I found out after the fact. <coughs> Um, I, I, but they were budgeted positions. I, I would think for a department head, we would keep council involved in that hiring. And I think in that case that you're mentioning, Mr. President, I think council was consulted, I recall. I mean, there was a discussion and and there was, council was consulted on that, I believe. That's my I recall. remember being pretty pretty clearly surprised. It's one of the, there, there are only a handful of things I hold against Charles <coughs> deeply this entire tenure I've been here. And one was being vice president of the council and finding out mm -hmm. via, you know, email that, hey, by the way, we I just mm -hmm. hired two people. Uh, so I did not know that was coming. I'm not saying I would necessarily change this. It, it could go either way, and I'd be fine with it. Mm -hmm. You know, um, but at the time I was a little surprised, and that had to do with the beginning of the stormwater authority and how we had things budgeted, which was fairly vague. At that time, it is not so anymore. So, <coughs> all right. Other thoughts about what you'd like to see there? Mr. Min expressed he'd involve council in the hiring of department heads in terms of a review and approval process, I guess. The, my hesitation really is, is that it, it can make it difficult if they, meeting the manager and the assistant manager and HR, if they need to move and, you know, make something happen and, and get someone to offer, it can make it difficult, right, and the longer that you wait, the, the more the people feel strung along and that's not helpful. I would leave it as it is, if anything, for the agility of the matter. Mrs. Butterfield, Mr. Carr, thoughts? I'm comfortable with what this is now. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, with how it is. All right. Chapter five, right. Yeah, any other questions about the examinations? That's the end of uh, chapter four. No. All right, which takes us to chapter five. Somehow I've messed this up. So this seems um, pretty straightforward and boilerplate here. Um, I'm sure this is federal vetted language, thoroughly by right labor council. Yeah, I'm thinking this is federal language. Out of the book, I, would be surprised I, I questioned the, the very closing phrase in the first paragraph that seems a little oddly worded. No offense, Mr. Eastman, but it sounds like something a lawyer would. <laughs> 
perhaps a politician. <laughs> Come now. No, I understand what you mean. The use of the word control is a little, you'd almost, you would think it would say something like prevail. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, that's generally how it all works anyway, right? And that's true of so many things that we we write in this manner. If there's mm -hmm. a conflict between the law and the policy, the law prevails. The law prevails, absolutely. Yeah, there's not going to be a question of that. Right. And the question the manager's asking about a role for the borough's HRC. And right, so some of these do directly deal with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this How is. How do we feel about that? This is a situation that would fall into the HRC's purview, and um, I don't know that we necessarily need to state that here, as we have that in the <coughs> ordinance. Um, as as it is now, anybody working in the borough has the ability to file a discrimination complaint with right. the HRC. So, right. I, I don't know that we need to restate that here. Um, Certainly, well, I you know, a new employee certainly isn't going to sit down and read the ordinance before the first day of work. So perhaps we do need, we, yeah. you know, do need to amend this with a statement saying that the, the, the I HRC think it, exists and what its facility is. I, th I think it could be brief, but it would be wise to put it. I down. mean, I know you all read the ordinance your first day of work. I think, I think in good faith for transparency, um, Almost like the fact that we have a non-discrimination ordinance, I think we should mirror the language in the equal, equal employment opportunity policy that we are indeed a borough that um, um, is putting their best foot forward, even though the rest of the Commonwealth may or may not be. Um, we should definitely have in here sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression right. spelled out so that there's no some question. Are there, some are not. Yeah. That we are that borough that is it's appreciative and understanding. Yeah, it's, 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 gender in identity. it's in there. It's in there. It's in there. Well, we've got gender identity. I don't see We're missing sexual orientation. I, don't, I see gender identity. I see genetic information. Yeah, I think the language in the, in the non-discrimination ordinance was sexual orientation, identity, gender, identity, or expression. I think, that, I think that's mm -hmm. how we would, we would have to word that there to uh, match that as clearly as possible. And then I guess maybe a statement at the end kind of summarizing the non-discrimination ordinance as part of, yeah, I think that, that would belong in there. We should make sure the language, language matches. I don't know that it's going to be possible to summarize the ordinance that closely perhaps we should just have a reference so the language that's in here is specifically from our labor attorney and it is concurrent with the current EEO sure so but is it it it's following state or federal guidelines and our ordinance goes further correct so our EEOC statement needs to mimic our ordinance correct but just seems odd that like sex isn't actually listed at all it does seem odd. Yeah. I think it should all be in. Yeah, Which we, could we, just be an error. We've got that listed. No, it was removed specifically on the advice of counsel, actually. Uh, but we will go back to Okay. Yeah, I think and, that's odd to not have sex listed because that's a pretty common point of discrimination, I would say. I, think, <coughs> I mean, think Labor Council consider that covered under gender identity. But we will go back and. Yeah, I would not concur that those are the same. Thing. No, and I the genetic information thing is weird too. Right. I don't think I've ever seen that expressed anywhere as a. That was specifically added at the advice yeah. of labor council. Huh. It was added to the EEOC. Yeah. All right. This is like an anticipation of DNA analysis that people might do in the future. It was added. So. Okay, but the EEOC uses. Yes, That's it what does. I'm thinking about. I mean, like, the things that are being done currently. Right. Yes. That's true. I suppose if your genetic information um, indicated that you were prone to, you know, some sort of, some sort of malady, mm -hmm. yeah. and then somebody decided not to hire you for insurance purposes, that would be pretty discriminatory. That's the only thing I can think of. 
Did labor attorneys suggest crossing out age? We will go back and review all this with labor counsel. Okay. Thank you. Like some I can understand, right? Religion being a place for religious freedom. Okay. I think that's everything. All right, so we'll revisit uh, 5.1, Labor Council revisit that, bring some other language uh, to, more reflect, to better reflect the uh, ordinance we have and, and cover anything that may not be covered in it that's required by the EOC. Mm -hmm. uh, any other items for discussion in Chapter 5? Um, Who is the EEO officer, or does it depend upon who's bringing forth the? Uh, the manager is. Historically, it's been the manager, yes. Which, in all fairness, it could be the manager or the HR coordinator, and I think this is designed to allow a person two different, at least two different avenues, and that's part of why I think that's set up that way. You can go to the manager or to the HR coordinator or your immediate supervisor. So it gives somebody a variety of options. Anything else in chapter five? All right, if not, uh, chapter six, employment, recruitment and hiring. Anything under 6.1? No. 6.2. Yes, I have yep. one on mm -hmm. 6.1. Yep. Um, in the final paragraph of A, Section A, uh, Are you that word for employment shall remain in the possession, not remail, shouldn't it? Are you looking at chapter little. six? I am looking at chapter six, three point one. Six point oh, three point one. one. Yeah, we're not we're not down there yet. <coughs> no, you're fine. That's what, okay. When you said item A. I was like, wait. A minute. All right, six point two are your reference checks. The only. And this is kind of true of all of this. Uh, maybe not all of it, right? It's not really true under 6.1, but 6.2, we start talking about reference checks, just to be aware of the variation with the uh, Civil Service Commission and how that's done. So I think that this is probably OK the way it is, but just to be aware of that. Right, it says the borough, and the borough is inclusive of all. Um, Chief, I'm thinking of the mechanics. So when we do a reference check, a background on a police department applicant, that could be conducted by the borough, or it could be conducted by a third party. We have changed it over the years to set the preference to conduct Sure that still has to be done by the police department because the third party contractor can't do clean NCIC, um, the, the, the criminal portion that's required by MOPEC, and the third party can't get the MOPEC records that are now required under um, the, the uh, act for previous employment and checking with previous employment. So the, that portion is done by us. And, but the, the main portion of the background, I know it seems confusing, but it's just the way the law, the law is written as to who has access to. Um, so, 
So I think that first paragraph covers that. Yeah, I think it does. I um, just want to kind of, I don't know, verify that, double check on that. Um, the other thing under 6.2 is, so this is written, I think, designed that if we received an inquiry from another employer, that that's all that you would provide. Um, that's yeah, we're, we're very yeah, limited in what we can actually say about a former employee. Right, so my question is, it doesn't even say anything about, so if, if an employee were terminated. You cannot say that. You cannot tell them that. Correct. So I guess what I'm thinking about is many years ago, we had an applicant here in the police department through the came through civil service and appealed their determination. So they were rejected based on background and another borough from the other side of South Mountain, Waynesboro, came over here and, and had to shed some light upon what had happened there. Now that was at that applicant's, if I'd say at his request, but it, by requesting a hearing, he opened the door for that. So if someone else in another jurisdiction, like, would we be permitted to provide that information? I believe in the police case, and I don't have that verbiage in front of me now but that uh, it's either act 57 or act 59 of i think it's yep. 20. Yeah. there's a new law gives the yeah. borough officers correct more latitude in what we uh, and actually have to give out about a former police officer so right. the same thing that requires the tracking of officers once they leave also gives the borough more latitude in what we can give out but it gives a, it, it 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 wouldn't apply to everybody only only sworn law enforcement positions and again i don't have that in front of me uh, but i don't know if you want to mimic that language in here or not but it, it does require the borough give out certain things pretty much full access to an employee file save any medical stuff yeah and so perhaps we should have something there after that third line of 6.2 that not really third line but third break there where somehow we kind of make a note right that if there's an inquiry that someone needs to refer to Act <coughs> 759 to make sure that we're gathering or providing everything that's supposed to be because I know the the sentiment in those laws was to ensure that you can't have bad cops moving around. Right. So we want to make sure that someone doesn't look at this and go, okay, I can only give these things. And I hate to say it, but we said earlier, right, you have to have somebody, would they know to go look somewhere else? You'd like to think so, but at the same time, how many times is that going to happen? This isn't necessarily a, an everyday type occurrence. So a few words in there to make sure they check. I would yeah. suggest, that, and I'm sure we will, but I would suggest that that's something that's vetted by Labor Council as well as to just exactly what we can do in those regards because I know there's some liability reduction in giving those things out that used to be there, but how far that goes and what it goes because it's, you know, as with several things, not exceptionally well written. <laughs> so yeah. well, we can make sure we're doing what we're supposed to be doing there, the spirit of those laws. So 6.3 is your interview. Now 6.3.1 background information. This is Butterfield. This is where you had a correction in here somewhere. Under A, the last paragraph shall remain in the possession, not shall remain in the possession. Okay, I think they must have already gotten to that because I see the line you're referring to and it says remain. So that must have been something they got to. Any other questions about 6.3? Just really. Just, A? Yes. I'm just wondering. I know it says it's that it's not an exhaustive list, but I'm wondering if we would want to include social media in here because more employers do check social media. Uh, you should not. It's check kind of a standard. It, it, it's not standard. You should not check somebody's social media. It can uh, expose you to information about them that might be discriminatory. It's used, though. I mean, I'm just saying. Well, I can tell you our employer says not to do it. Okay. Okay. That's 
there. Interesting. <laughs> I mean, I think a, an important paragraph there is you know, information about the applicant shall be obtained legally and ethically and remain confidential. I mention that because it's people will when they're advising applicants they you know especially college students to be very careful about that you know what's yeah posted. Um, so. yeah so our, our guidance from uh, from the college's HR department is that um, when you look at somebody's social media you can be exposed to information about them that they wouldn't have to disclose right. on an application like for example a physical disability or um, right. a mental health issue and if you and use then that, make yeah. that decision to not hire them because you, you don't want right. to deal with that whatever it, I mean it it right. opens you up to all sorts you of just can't make a determination about it yeah right it's yeah if it's not information germane to whether they are qualified to perform the job or not the qualifications right. of the job then you should not be taking it into consideration right. and you shouldn't know about it Any other uh, questions with 6.3? If not, we go to 6.4, selection, selection outcomes and notification. That takes us to 6.5. Residency. I think six five one is weak. I think it just doesn't, you know, it says <coughs> that while not required to be residents of the borough, you're encouraged to become residents within six months um, following completion of the probationary period. But what there's nothing to enforce that. So why do we even have that in here is what I'm wanting, wondering. That's fair. And I, th I think the issue of 6.5, right, is that our collective bargaining agreements have been changed over the years such that one simply does not have to reside in the borough, whereas one time they did. And so then the question comes, if you can't re require your uniform and non-uniform people to live in the borough, then is it really appropriate to require your department heads live in the borough you know like it, that's the issue right so <coughs> right you're gonna allow one type of employee to and the CBAs are going to prevail right so you're gonna allow one type of employee to be outside and another not to and that is inherently going to create conflict between my preference would be that they all live in the borough right right and up until from my understanding up until our current borough manager who does live own a property and lives in the borough I think the previous borough manager it was changed so that she did not have to live in in the borough that is I correct think that's and when it was, it was diluted that yeah was when this language it had been right. stronger in the past but for her it had been a requirement that the manager and the chief re reside in the municipality right. right and that has changed over the years I think that's important yeah I, think I mean I can important. remember a practical application moment when we talked about the uh, Creekside Apartments earlier, and I could remember it must have been a holiday because I was off and it wasn't the summer. And Dave Sanders and I trying to get some way to get letterhead to post a voluntary evacuation on that building because the water was about six inches or four inches below the uh, the road surface, and that previous manager could not be reached in any way and was nowhere near the borough. <coughs> so, I mean, yeah, you're not going to get an objection for me uh, in terms of the manager living in the borough. I mean, obviously the chief of police doesn't currently live in the borough, so I don't think it's really proper to... Well, I think you have to grandfather people to and change you don't that live right in now. now. Right, but I, yeah. I think we need to look... I, I think this is weak. But having a, a manager that lives in the borough, I would like to think that subsequent managers would live in the right. borough also. Yeah. 
especially when you're talking about taxes and right. mm -hmm. yeah. you know I, I agree with Ms. Lawson um, I think if the language is weak um, and I agree grandfathering and current current employees but and I agree President Heiser that yeah we would like all of our employees to live in the borough you got you want skin in the game you pay our taxes we pay them they should pay them I well, definitely think the borough manager and chief of police yeah. should live in the borough. For and I sure. think right now we have one Going officer forward. who lives in the borough. Yeah, correct. So. Well, again, that's true across many of your right. departments. Right, right. You know, that's the thing. I, I, I guess I do And it's look. changed over the years. I understand I that. But I, I think I feel strongly about this. And I, we've talked about this before. I mean, well, I think especially right now, if you have a manager that lives in the borough, yeah. you know, if you get to the day that, he moves on, I, I would expect the next person to do the same. You know, it's a little different than accepting that job as opposed to maybe accepting a department head job. There is a different level of expectation. Yeah. You know, it would be great for all, but I think there's a different level of expectation when you're going to run the operation. And I mean, the borough being the size that it is, it also deals with the responsiveness, right? To a certain sense, of availability, right? Whether he wants to think of it or not, he's basically a 24, 365 employee. Right. If he or she, right, is doing yeah. their job, so. That's pretty much how that works, unless, you know, I have called him at times that, who do I call about this vehicle into the building? This has become a Gettysburg thing the last few years. You know, but who do I call? Is this a Chad Clayball? All hours of the is day. Is this a Clem Malott, you know? You'd be happy to well, know. Well, and that's that different, I think, because it. you should yeah. be able to reach your department heads any time, I think. You know, they should be. You should have a way to reach them, so regardless of whether they live in or out of the borough. But I, I do think that these two positions, especially, should be. They're just to me, they're unique compared to the others. Yeah. They're, they they reach a higher standard. If you wanted to reflect the CBA, I believe we did negotiate for this past one that it was more of a radius and a time limit. So if you wanted to look at that, because if, I mean, I understand wanting to have somebody the skin in the game, but you also have to think about if, you know, Charles were to leave tomorrow, the housing market, if you were to get a borough manager in here, how quickly are they going to be able to buy a house in the area, especially if it's in the borough versus uh, giving them a radius to look at that's only like 30 minutes away or 20 minutes or whatever. I mean, it, it, just looking at the more of a feasibility and an inclusiveness of it. I mean, I guess I think like when I bought property, I put a pin in a map and drew a circle around the fire department. And, and most people do. I mean, and you that don't was for typically something that's, want to communicate. That's for something I don't get paid to do. Yeah, you don't typically want to right. commute outside of 30 minutes because then, I mean, I personally don't want to do that. I mean, I wouldn't want to travel an hour or two and from work every day, you know, just one way. Um, but having more of a radius or like within 30 minutes of the borough, would be more inclusive than to just have it just to the borough because I mean just forward thinking if there's no housing market or if the housing they can't afford a house in the area or maybe they're just not in a, a buying um, position then you don't have to think about rental properties and all that stuff and what's available especially for families if they were to have one I mean there's just a lot of moving pieces to nailing down somebody with a, you have to live in the borough. While it's all great to have that, and I, I would advocate, you know, it's, it, it would be a heavy suggestion or maybe like it would be really nice to have them live in the borough, you're kind of narrowing down your application, like your applicants. And if I may, because you're talking about the position I currently hold, and you're right, I don't live in a borough, but I can tell you that we, you know, we have issues with recruiting policemen now and those recruitment issues are climbing up the chain. Uh, so you're gonna severe, you know, when I move on, you're gonna severely limit your applications if you advertise that you're gonna require your police chief to live in the borough. As to where if you have a response radius, that's that's a little better and you know, you can strongly encourage. Uh, I'm just pointing out, you can agree or disagree with me, but uh, you know, I, I, th th there's, some, there's some distinct factors about living right here as the police chief that are compounded. Um, so I, you, know, you may limit your, your applicant pool if you do that. I mean, just to clarify, when I drew my circle, it was like a mile radius, not 30 minutes. Um, there's a very diverse housing stock in the borough. I, I'm inclined to include it. 
I mean, there are a lot of different neighborhoods. There's, I, I mean, yeah, I know it's a struggle. I, I bought with not a lot of resources and did so. Professionally, managers overwhelmingly, that might be a strong word, but support the concept of managers and chiefs living in the municipality that they work in. That's mm-hmm. the best practice in the profession of municipal management. Thoughts, folks? We can always revisit it, but thoughts would be good. Um, <coughs> I, I would be in favor of the residency requirement. For those two positions, yes. Mm-hmm. Butterfield? Yes, I agree, but um, you know, I'm involved with the housing problem in Adams County, not just Gettysburg, and the lack thereof. One of our ABC chairs has a son who wants to move here uh, to the borough, and he just can't find property available. So we can say strong wording with that, but there might come a time when (coughs) the person we want to be manager or chief just flat can't find anything available. So at that time, we would have to go in and say a, a, a variance, if you will, an, an exception. I believe that's what happened with my predecessor. Yeah, that's yeah. exactly I what mean, happened. I mean, usually you give the person a year. It is. Yeah. And right. that's why the wording is what it is today. It's not right. as strong right. as it was before your predecessor. Did we check that language against the ordinance provisions creating those? So, I mean, you're going to just want to make sure that you have a consistency between what you've ordained and what you place in the uh, manual. All right. So what I'm hearing is a residency requirement. So what I'm hearing going forward, unless I'm mistaken, that's what I'm hearing. And uh, I think they should have a year to to satisfy. I think that's reasonable. For future. Absolutely. Then these are for future hires. Right. And if we run into problems, then we will address it again. But I think Well, it gives you your second step of what right. Mrs. Butterfield's describing, whereas if you really decided that right. hey Right. You know And, and there we'll are make efforts there are different groups. I was at, at a meeting at the seminary two weeks ago, I think, about housing. I mean housing is a certainly an issue um, in this community, countywide, that needs to be addressed. But I think the manager has talked about, you know, best practices and I think that's that's important. I think some of our problems have come back to that that issue. So I'm willing to. Yeah, I mean, it is different living in the borough. Yeah. And that's part of it. Like you, I don't know. I think it's important to understand what it means to live in the borough. And there are different housing types available. But, you know, I told Chris more than one time, you take my house, put it in another town where we work, and it's worth having. That's just the nature of it. All right. Sounds like we have 6.5 or less worked out. Veterans' preference is required by law. Uh, 6.7 citizenship verification. So, yeah, Judy and I both questioned this. Is this a, re- a requirement under state law, a citizenship requirement? It's the I-9, and it is required. Well, I-9 just establishes your ability to work in the U.S. It doesn't necessarily require citizenship. You can have work well, visas. Yeah, you can have your you can have visas, but it, and even if you have a green card or anything like that or any kind of like you know, you you would give your your verification number for the I-9 plus your identification and for the I-9 it requires two legal documents or one pass a passport or you know whatever other requirement for item A and then you have an item B and C which is normally most people use their driver's license and social security card which then would be your um, your citizenship (laughs) verification okay so I just want to make sure I, I am understanding your intent here uh, we'll employ citizens and individuals who are authorized. Yes. Okay. Okay. Any other questions about 
Is that the latest legislation? The, the I nine hasn't really changed in forever. I mean, they yeah. they update it, um, but yes, that is current. So yeah, I think what Mrs. Butterfield's referring to is the IRCA there of nineteen eighty six. Is that the? I'll double check it just to make sure. I can't speak to that. I don't know. Has it been reviewed by enough? Labor Council because? We send everything to Labor Council as a general say, yeah. Yeah. So that's so certainly, that uh, I mean, that's okay. certainly, as a lawyer, that would be one of the things that you should check and verify that there's appropriate references to the correct law. Okay. All right. 6.8 is probationary period, which is one year. Um, Depending on the CBA. I was going to say, and do you want to? There should be something in there about the collective bargaining agreement because it that's is, it's not listed in a footnote. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to say because that's not always correct. Yeah, that's what I thought. That's what the little four next to the word period is. I see. And I go down to the bottom. Okay. Questions about six eight. No. Not six point nine nepotism. G's and granddaughter under B. Two G's or two D's? My, I don't see two G's. And no, it's been struck through. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I was looking at the one above, granddaughter in law. <coughs> it's been corrected. That's pretty far. I'm looking at an uncorrected version. First cousin spouse seems kind of far. <coughs> barely know one of my first cousin's spouses. <laughs> I mean, that's just true. We've met like a handful of times, but. All right, any uh, questions or issues under 6.9.1, let's say? No. All right, 6.9.2 involves post-employment relationships. Okay, then 6.10 and 6.11, you'll see notes on, which Labor Council recommends the removal. We have a standalone for the ADA, and they just recommended the removal of affirmative action, is that correct? 6.10. Can I just go back to it? Just yes, to, certainly. We don't have partners included in there. Is that something that we should think about uh, yeah so I think what this is structured let me re go back to the definition of affinity here so I think what they're relying on is the the legal concept of marriage to provide that mm -hmm. so I guess so if there's nothing in writing I guess the question would become like, how do you determine whether or not someone is or is not, mm -hmm. right? Which I think is why some of those laws changed years ago, right, as the courts and so forth, because it provides that legal mm -hmm. jointure. That out there, so. Yeah, no, yeah. it's it's a good, it's a point well taken. Um, I guess from an employment standpoint, an employer standpoint, like you know. Trying to think of what our responsibilities are and what the employees' responsibilities are. So, I mean, I kind of presume that most of this section seems to be it, it's relying on the 
the borough more or less to know and for the person to disclose. But it almost seems like it's targeted that, you know, we're talking about hiring and promotion and things of that nature. Yeah. Well, it's, it's interesting we mentioned those relationships in the next section, but not in this section. We talk about what happens after employment has ended, but not in terms of hiring. Oh, I see what you mean. Well, okay, so there's yeah. a there's a paragraph, the second paragraph under 6.9 is for the purposes of this policy, a relative is any person who is related by affinity, marriage, or consanguinity, blood, or whose relationship with the employee is similar to that of a person, of persons who are related by blood or marriage. I think that would cover uh, partnership or okay. romantic involvement. Works. Thank you. Okay. All right. So, any other questions with six point nine? All right. If not, six point ten. Did uh, Labor Council give you any kind of? explanation beyond what is there. When legal, if I identify a specific underrepresented group that is not in your employment. Affirmative action plans are plan. only legal if they identify a specific underrepresented group that is not in your employment by percentage and a tangible plan to encourage more applications employment. This general statement will lead to liability. Hmm. Could lead to liability. So just a generalized statement without something that's without a corrective plan. Comprehensive. Yeah. The borough's not an overly large employer. I know some people perceive it to be so. And we do have non discrimination practices in place. Okay. All right. Six point eleven was sort of an odd duplicate entry right. for an entire chapter. So that's why that's deleted. Okay. Uh, 6.12 job descriptions. The questions in Under 12.4E, I know this had been a note at one point, I think. Yeah, I had suggested, I wondered if it was still relevant and whether or not we should strike it. Yeah, my note was whether per diem employees even existed or if it's something we wouldn't have the flexibility to do in the future, but it, I guess I'm thinking about. So yeah, the, the uh, rationale to discuss it is when we go on conferences and such, uh, the employees that uh, go to dinner, for example, and normally would get reimbursed um, for those dinner's expenses, there's really no specified limit on to what they could purchase. So this... You know, it has not been an issue because everyone's always done reasonable things. This puts order to what could potentially be chaos. <laughs> we haven't experienced the chaos yet, but that's the purpose of having the discussion. There are municipalities that when you're away on business, you have X to spend in a day, for example. Yeah, like the federal government. Right. Or state employees or right. whatever. Yeah. Right. Not all state employees, I don't think. 
Now, trust me, FEMA, FEMA is not per diem. FEMA is. So I know that because of my wife's work habits. But is that a, I mean, we don't have that as a class of employee, though. It, it's more like a, a practice. It almost feels like it should fit somewhere else. Like maybe a policy statement on how per, per diems are administered. Um, that might be its own section. Yeah, it was put here just because it doesn't exist anywhere else in the current manual. Yeah, I, I don't think it would. I don't think it counts as an employee classification, though. It would seem to imply that your salary is per diem, which doesn't make any sense. Yeah, I think we just need to find another home for that. It, it doesn't seem like it fits there. Well, that, that, that's assuming that you even want to keep it. I mean, this is something you're interested in diving into. Well, I mean, I, I think it was near Pittsburgh somewhere. But recently there was a pretty extravagant, maybe it was near Philadelphia. I don't know. One of the two, right? Like these things do happen. Somewhere in the manual there probably should be some parameters about what can be spent and how. Like that needs to exist. Could you not put it in Chapter 7 under compensation? Just put like a per diem for any kind of training or travel expenses? somewhere in there something there around the time or around the location where you have the mileage figures and so forth is a similar type thing it has to be some sort of a a limit and it's going to change i'm sure over time but some sort of guidance and i know that where some of these things are held are are rather expensive um right i'm aware of that you know uh but at the same time even that they're expensive like there are parameters for that and, and that's a good reason to make sure this thing's revised periodically. So we're adding it to yeah. where the I think we would yep. move it down. Okay. Yeah. And we can just so on we there. could come uh, come back with specific recommendations on what that am amount or amounts should be. Yeah, and I think we could roll it into Chapter 7 somewhere and... And there might be federal guidance on that, just like there's a federal mileage rate and things like that. What the federal per diem is, which might make it simple. Federal guidance tends to be really high, a little higher than I would actually be comfortable with. <laughs> yeah, now like I know that's a common tactic among right. FEMA employees. Oh yes, I know all too well how yeah. can we look, they can use we their per diems as extra compensation. So it's right. less of a per diem. We take a look at accounting employee handbook practice mm. for that but just particular giving topic. Some parameters about what's appropriate so that no one thinks that they're really. Yeah. Yeah. And it just that's what I'm saying. Yeah, it gives somebody some guidance in case they needed it. Mr. Carr had a pretty good suggestion. Sorry. Would you like, could you repeat that, Jenna? I was asking if we could look at that specific topic with the county employee handbook. Um, yeah. Perhaps they have. we should be around that same level or below. Um, we are a very small municipality <coughs> in com comparison to other municipalities in the Commonwealth, but maybe that's a first, a, a place to start to check. Yeah, I mean, I think we can maybe look at what some of our experience has been too. You know, I can think we had a, a department head of it in a conference in a major city recently where it's, it's only offered in that major city. Right. So it kind of is what it is. And what I don't want people to be in is where we are. So at our place of employment, if you try to go to a conference, you might as well forget it. Uh, it's a CBA regulated item, but you can't go anywhere for the amount of money that's provided. Yeah. All right. So uh, I think what we'll do is we'll break there and we'll we'll start with chapter seven in May. Okay. Compensation. Oh, I thought we were going through 10 tonight. That's good. <laughs> I'm really relieved. Well, we actually got through another three. So yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, Mr. Mayor so Wise pointed out that it's, like, once you get into it, it's, it's quite likely. That'd be a good place to go. So, All right, that takes us to new business. The feasibility of a trail to the Adams County Historical Society, Mr. Oval. <coughs> Should have everyone stand up and spin around, drink some coffee, and employee, employee policy manuals. While uh, very important, aren't the most exciting topic. <laughs> I don't know whatever you mean. <laughs> um, 
That's that's why you're not getting it every four like you should. Yeah. As it really should be. Yeah. I'm Dennis Hickathier, uh, 85 Bitter and Drive in Cumberland Township. I'm a board member with Healthy Adams Bicycle Pedestrian Incorporated. And the reason we're here, why I'm here today, you may wonder, we're talking about a trail out to the Historical Society. Of course, they are located in Cumberland Township, as is their neighbor, Transitions Healthcare. However, as you'll find out when Mr. Claybaugh does his presentation, uh, almost half of the trail will be in the borough of Gettysburg. And so we need your support. We're going to need your help in order to make this happen. And Mr. Claybaugh will explain that. Uh, some of you may also be wondering, well, there are sidewalks to the end of the borough property. Why don't we just extend the sidewalk out to the uh, Historical Society? Why do we need a trail? And of course, being from Happy, you might guess the answer to that. We see you know, that trail as an extension of the Gettysburg Inner Loop, as a spur off the Inner Loop. And what we've been trying to do throughout the last 10, 12, 15 years is to create a safe place for people to bicycle to different locations, people who are not comfortable riding on the road, children who are too young to ride on the road. And if you could imagine, uh, there's a lot of people that live around the college area. And think about uh, a young family and there's a, a child's activity out at the historical center like there was this last weekend. And the parents decide, well, let's hop on our bikes or take a walk, get on a trail and take the children out to the historical society for an afternoon event. And so this is the thing that we're trying to do is to build a safe infrastructure to get people to that location. Uh, the vision that I'd like you to think about uh, in the borough is basically a double sidewalk where you have room for both pedestrians and bicycles. Uh, and the vision in terms of transitions health care would be similar to the north trail that goes out to the Gettysburg High School or the trail that goes along the Fever Street where the new middle school is. That's the vision that we're trying to create out to the historical society. Now this, uh, this has been going on actually, well, I guess I better look at the next slide here. So why do we want to do all this? And I've mentioned some of this, but of course, you know, as you see, there's no sidewalk. There's a 40 mile an hour speed limit. So people that aren't used to riding on roads are not going to want to, uh, to do that, to go the road route. We, uh, Patty, uh, Ms. Lawson has told us that there are a number, and, and Ms. Lawson's been on our steering committee, that there are a number of college professors that are going to actually conduct some classes out at the Historical Society. And so you're going to have other students probably that are doing some kind of term paper or some kind of research at that facility. And you're going to have students going all kinds of different directions. And it's better to have some sort of designated controlled pathway out there because it's going to be safer. You're not going to have people crossing all over, you hope. With college students, you're never quite sure. Uh, and of course, if you live across town, you feel like, you know, I really don't want to walk two miles to get to the historical society, but I would like to hop on my bike and be able to take the inner loop or some safe way to get out to the historical society. Why should I, you know, add to the traffic problem, add to the pollution problem, add to the parking problem because the parking out there is rather limited. And so this trail also serves to take some vehicles off the road and out of the parking lot and, peop and people are getting exercise while they're actually getting to a, a good destination that they want to go to. So this actually started almost two years ago. In uh, June of 2021, Andrew Dalton, the executive director, and I sat down with the board of directors for the conservation district. And we suggested to them to try and make a trail from the North Trail, which goes out to the high school, across the back of the Ag Center property to the back of the parking lot for the Historical Society. That idea was not approved, and so I quickly realized that we needed an engineering firm to do a thorough assessment of how and where to build the trail out to the Historical Society. So we went out after some grants, and we were able to get funding from the uh, Robert C. Hoffman Trust. 65%, uh, 63% of the grants came from them. We were able to get a South Mountain Mini Grant for about 15%, and then Happy kicked in the rest of the money. So we funded this study and we were able to uh, contract with C.S. Davidson and Chad to do the analysis because although it sounds rather simple, as you'll find when Chad talks, there's a lot of uh, complications in the process. 
So I'm going to let Chad talk about the analysis and what, what recommendations he's come up with, and then we'll talk about next steps. And let me just ask, Ms. Lawson, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? I don't think so, no. I think okay. we covered it. Thank you. So before I get into the slides with the, the actual uh, layout and design, I did want to say one other thing with the <clears> process. The, the end here is that we are going to have a bound master plan, and I believe that this will be housed on the HAVI website. Um, so we're close to um, publishing this document. It's been through several iterations of revisions. If you all have any comments to add to it tonight, we'll do one more round of revisions, um, and then we'll have this published. It'll also come complete with a, a, a sketch plan. Um, I'm not going to get into all of the doc this document. This document's quite intensive. It has a lot of the design standards, the references, those kind of things. Um, the important part, uh, what you guys are going to want to see is, is the layout. So, and I apologize, I, I wasn't able to fit all of it on one sheet and have it be legible. So it's actually two sheets. I'll just give you uh, a little bit to get your bearings here. North is, is to the right. So this thing's laying on its side. This is Broadway. And this is Carlisle Street heading north out of the borough. Um, there's going to be two slides here. I'm going to just jump back and forth for a second. This continues on north out of the borough where the last one left off. And this is Howard Avenue, the National <coughs> Park Service Drive. This is the new Adams County Historical Society site here. One thing to point out uh, right off the bat is that, like Dennis said, the borough line is actually right along Alms Run here. This is dubbed Alms Run. I think the Alms House is the old Adams um, County Conservation District. And um, the borough line follows Alms Run, but then it goes north uh, down Carlisle Street. So everything to the west of this is in the borough. That's the college property here where they do the intramural sports. That's in the borough. And then everything to the east of it, such as Transitions Health Care, is technically in the township, Cumberland Township. And then again, this slide, this is the borough line, and it actually turns and goes down Howard. So again, this is in the borough. This is in the township. Um, so the first thing I wanted to point out before I get into um, the prefer preferred and the secondary trail routes is some other routes that we considered um, that, that don't show up on this plan. Um, so real quickly, um, this is Jacob's Alley down here. We did take a look at Jacob's Alley as a potential option. It, of course, has a stream crossing. It goes into transitions where they didn't want it. Um, we quickly rolled that out. It just didn't feel right for the trail route. Uh, we also looked at the east side of Carlisle Street. Uh, the problem with the east car side of Carlisle Street is there is more parking there um, that would have to be eliminated. There's utility pool conflicts. Um, and I believe those are the two main, main issues was the utility poles and the parking on that side. Oh, and, and also if you come you up that side, bridge there. you do have an, a bit, bit of an issue with that crossing. It would be hard to get across that Alms, Alms Creek there. Um, the west side is a little bit easier for the crossing because it is softer on that side in terms of the grades. And the, there, while there also is parking on the west side of the street, it is very under underutilized. Most people don't even realize that you can park there. Um, and we did talk to the property, some of the property owners that live there, and nobody had an, any major objections to eliminating the parking on that side um, because most of these properties, I think, believe all of them actually have parking in the rear. Um, so the primary route that we decided on is 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 this. It starts and it follows this yellow color here, crosses the street comes down behind these sycamores on the Adams County Historical Society, or I'm sorry, the um, Transitions Healthcare property, and then this continues on to the front of the, the Historical Society. So this piece right here, and this is where the primary route ends. So again, it segments one, two, and three. This is segment one, this is segment two, and this is segment three, this little piece here. And that brings you into the front door of the Adams County Historic Society. Um, some other things I wanted to point out to you is uh, with that primary route, uh, like Dennis said, we aren't necessarily promoting a sidewalk, just a sidewalk. We're also promoting a trail. It's a shared use uh, facility. Uh, you may have heard me discuss in, in the past the width. What, essentially, what, we, what the only difference here is the width. 
A, a sidewalk is typically four to five feet. A trail has to be a minimum of eight feet when it's in de densely populated area. And then when it's not densely populated, it has to be 10 feet. That's according to the Federal Highway Administration standards. Um, so what we're proposing here is an eight foot wide tr shared trail. We're proposing concrete in this case. There are some locations in a borough where it's asphalt. Um, but in this case, we're proposing an eight foot wide concrete. It would be separated by a grass strip because if there was bikes heading north on this shared trail, that would be contra flow, just like we had it earlier, to the vehicles that are heading south. So there's a grass strip here with a vertical separation, has that vertical curb, and it has, would have trees planted in a four foot grass strip. Um, and then at this point, we would, um, we would cross the street as perpendicular as possible. Uh, one of the ideas that we came up with is, may, is maybe it doesn't have to be exactly perpendicular. We bounced this off a of PennDOT. They didn't necessarily object to it. Um, to, to make it more perpendicular would require um, some more retaining walls. Um, and I'll come back to one of the potential hurdles with that here in a minute. Um, but we would like to try to cross that as perpendicular and as short as possible. Um, and then um, we did show some locations on this plan for stormwater management. That's what you can see in the, like this hatch pattern, this hatch pattern is stormwater management potential sites. Uh, right along this piece of the trail, one of the, the, the aspects that you see out there right away if you're heading out to the historical society is these large, beautiful sycamore trees. So we wanted to incorporate that, incorporate that into the trail planning. Um, this side, uh, doesn't have any trees and it never will because of the easement. I'll come back to that in a second. Um, so we did want to incorporate that component to it. There is a 60 foot building setback. Um, so when we approached Transition Healthcare about potentially putting the trail behind the trees, they were open to it since essentially they can't do anything with that 60 foot building setback anyways. Should they want to build on in the future, uh, it, this trail wouldn't necessarily impact. In fact, it would help them uh, fulfill some of their ordinance requirements to having a sidewalk in their front yard. Um, we did show this is just a yield sign here and it's hard to see on your slide but we are going to cross transitions health cares um, parking lot access drive um, and then at this this location right here we looked at two different options one is coming back further in the historical society um, but what we preferred is the route coming right into the front door there's a stormwater management facility here, um, so there is some hurdles with, um, with that component as well. There's a, a fence that we would have to get over, there's a spillway, there's some design uh, reviews that would have to be done by the township's engineer, um, and we, would, we are looking to potentially put in a little bit of a retaining wall here on the side of the stormwater facility so that we don't take up any more parking spaces. Uh, we know parking um, out there at the Historical Society is going to be uh, at a premium, so uh, when we when we talked to the folks from Adams County Historical Society, they, they did say that they would like us to, to keep as many parking spaces as possible. So we're trying to keep it out of there um, and put in a retaining wall if it's possible. So that's the preferred route. Um, I'm just going to give you um, a real brief tour of a potential <coughs> secondary or ancillary routes. Uh, whenever we were studying this, we, we noticed a lot of college students coming down here and just walking, crossing over here and everywhere in and out of this site right here. Um, so Smith Alley becomes a natural connection. Uh, we're looking to potentially put a bollard up right here just to keep vehicles off of this um, because since this isn't a densely populated area, it could be 10 feet wide. Um, that would look like a road to a, a vehicle. Um, uh, but we could potentially put a connection there to, to Smith Alley. Um, and then we could also put a, a, a trail up this side. Um, this is through those um, intramural sports fields um, and then connect into at, to, to Howard Avenue. We also looked at another potential crossing site if this would become the primary route that this would become a potential crossing site. Uh, now here are some of the reasons why that wasn't the preferred route and the one that I showed you earlier is the preferred route. The main reason is because the college's parcel also is overlain by a, an easement that is owned by the um, the Gettysburg National Military Park. Uh, it, that easement says that you can only have cinders, you can't have anything concrete, asphalt, something like that. It says that you can't have any trees, um, so you don't have any of that, vision, that, that buffer. Um, and it, 
it, it would take some some extra hurdles and hoops to jump through to be able to have an additional easement, our easement, over top of their easement, over top of the college's property. Um, also, this crossing here, the speed limit changes right around this location. There's a speed limit sign. In the borough, it's 25 mile an hour. As soon as you get to this location, it changes to 40 mile an hour. Uh, now, regardless of what we do, we would like to, uh, along with the design phase of this project, we would like to uh, request from PennDOT that the speed limit be reduced to 25 mile an hour all the way to Howard Avenue. That seems like the more appropriate route. We think that, that that's more, more potentially uh, um, feasible once the Adams County Historic Society is built, once our preferred route is built, um, then we feel like there's going to have this natural calming effect and the, the vehicles will be driving slower, which will help, as you know, from to, to get a speed limit study, uh, speed limit reduced, you would have to have the 85th percentile um, be below that speed. That's really going to help your cause. So if the 85th percentile will be down to that 25 or even maybe 35, it's really going to help the study if we could get it we could get that done. So regardless of what we do with the project, we are going to be looking to PennDOT to see if we can get the, redu the speed limit reduction reduced. But as it stands at 40 mile an hour, you cannot put a, a um, crosswalk that is designed for ADA compliance as we have it proposed. You can have a trailhead. Think of the, uh, the um, different trails that are in the, the, the national forests. You have a trail, it's a walking trail, and it crosses a street, and then another trail it picks up on the other side of the road. But there's no uh, warning domes there. There's no uh, designated crosswalk. There's no uh, piano keys. We would like to have all of th those things. We would like to have this thing be ADA compliant. Uh, we have Transitions Healthcare right here where you do have, uh, you know, Americans with Disabilities. Uh, we would like to have Americans with Disabilities be able to ac access the um, Adams County Historical Society. Um, so then we don't want this to be a trailhead. And so to have this to be a proper crosswalk, um, you can't do that in a 40 mile an hour speed limit since it's a mid-block crossing. It would have to be reduced to 35 or below. So for those reasons, this became, um, these all, all of these trail options, what, what, they still have merit. Um, they are a, a good potential in the future, but they became the second option. Uh, one other thing that you'll notice is that we showed a potential option continuing out to Howard. Uh, we do notice that there's a pot plenty of bikers and runners and everything that uses Howard Avenue. There's a trail system over on Mummersburg Road, and there's a trail system um, to the east on Old Harrisburg Road, the, 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 um, the North Gettysburg Trail that goes out to the Gettysburg High School. Um, so a connection to Howard would make sense um, to connect those loops. But again, the primary goal for this feasibility study was to get to the Historical Society. So. We would potentially stop it for at this point and then connect in the future. There's some other hurdles that would have to happen in here as well, or some stormwater management facility, a split rail fence, those kind of things, but um, nothing that is um, impossible to overcome. Did I miss anything, Dennis? I think you covered <laughs> So this is the cost estimate slide. Um, I'm only showing you the cost estimate for segments uh, one, two, and three. That's that preferred primary route. Uh, we do have a complete cost estimate analysis for all of the other ancillary routes. Um, the total project cost was around $1.2 million, but we didn't want to um, dwell in all of those things. Uh, we want to take a look at just this preferred primary route because when we go to the next steps, this is what we're going to be talking about. Um, we estimate the design and permitting at around $60,000. Um, often we say 25% of the total construction cost is your engineering. We think it can be a little bit cheaper than that if we do all three of these these segments at the same time. So I think that's an important component. And really designing them separately doesn't really work logistically. Um, we also are hoping that one of the funding sources here is potentially DCNR as a C2P2 grant, just like we have for the Gatesburg Interloop. Um, if we use that grant source, that's a little bit easier in terms of the design and permitting than a full-blown PennDOT plan. So this cost estimate here is assuming that there isn't the requirement for a full PennDOT um, DM2 and DM3 design. Um, construction costs, um, the set three segments, whoops, I'm sorry, the three segments that we're looking at, segment one is 186, segment two is 145, segment three is 99. Um, that first segment's the segment in the borough uh, where we would be bumping the curb out, making an eight foot wide concrete sidewalk, 
new concrete curbing, adding the trees, that's the most expensive component of this. When you get to segment two, that's where it goes in behind the sycamores and then all you're looking at is a, a 10 foot wide asphalt trail at that point. Um, that's way, way cheaper than, than the curb and sidewalk component. And then in that segment three is, is the smallest of the three. That's just that tiny little piece on the Adams County Historical Society parcel. Uh, also, one, one of the things that I failed to mention is that we would be looking to put a bike rack here at this location. So the total cost for segments one, two, and three is uh, we're looking at around 490000 We think this thing is, is just under half a million dollars to, to, to build. Um, that does have contingencies in it. Um, has a, a construction contingency and it also assumes that this thing isn't going to get built for another three years so it does um, build in some inflation costs so we feel like that's a conservative number we feel like um, that we're confident that we could we could get it done for that number so, go, let me take some questions first questions or do you want to go over next steps? take <coughs> questions first Something. questions on the design or the alignment just just to mention I know that um, Mr. Claybaugh and uh, Mr. <coughs> and I have met with most of the partners there. The college um, transitions folks met with us, and the Adams County Historical Society um, and the township the board president. So, so you'll be making this presentation to the township then? No, we don't intend to. Um, we're hoping that since this is being televised, um, it was advertised. Um, Dennis sent out an advertisement saying that this is going to be. Um, presented here um, we're hoping that this is uh, this is kind of the end of the public meetings there was another public meeting there's minutes from all of these these discussions in this master plan um, there was another public meeting held at the Charlie Sterner building over at the uh, Gettysburg Rec Park and earlier. a lot of the neighbors came I did Fact have one meeting with Cumberland Township yeah about. Cumberland Township manager and public works director have been involved Jim B. Sager with the college and Chris has been involved um, Zach Belitho with the National Park Service has been involved. Did we meet with uh, did with Cumberland Township or? Yes. Okay. Yep. The and manager and the public works director, and even one of the supervisors. And are they willing to share some costs? And did they? Yes. I'll yeah, turn, turn that, that over to them. <laughs> yeah, Cumberland Township. Well, I would hope so. Yes, we've we've had a lot of discussions. Uh, two things. Oops. Let's go to the next slide here. Um, of course, we realize there's a big hurdle to climb uh, to raise the money. DCNR will provide 50% of the funding, and so we have a major fundraising effort ahead of us, and we're planning to talk to some professional organizations that, write, that obtain grants and, and uh, grant funding and so forth for trails. So we realize that's a, that's a challenge, but before we can even apply for a grant to DCNR, we have to have two things. One is an MOU for a trail easement agreement. Now, Transitions Healthcare has been very supportive, but they don't actually own the property. It's owned by Omega Healthcare Investors Incorporated, a real estate corporation. And we've had contact with them as well, and they are also favorable to the idea. They can't, as Chad mentioned, it's in the setback, so they can't really use the land anyway. It's advantageous for their employees, some of which walk out to the facility to work, it's advantageous for patients and visitors who come who want to take somebody in a wheelchair around. So it's a good thing for them too. So they do support it. So what we're in the process of doing is drafting an MOU about who's going to, you know, we agree to take the ease, we agree to give you the land, we agree to take the land. Well, who's going to take the easement? Now uh, there's several, several possibilities for holding the trail easement. The Historical Society and Happy are both 501c3 nonprofit organizations. Uh, we and Happy have really no interest in, in holding the trail easement. You know, we don't know if we'll be around in 10 years. The Historical Society could certainly hold the easement, but when you compete for money with DCNR, you compete for different pots. And nonprofit organizations do not compete for as big of a pot as municipal authorities. And in the past, we partnered with Gettysburg Area Recreation Authority to get a grant for a trail study for a trail going down to Maryland. And that was very successful. And we've met with their board members, their board of directors, and they are willing and agreeable to do the same thing again. And only this time it would in actually involve holding a trail easement. And then they would be the grant applicant. We usually do the work behind the scenes to help them with the grant application. 
So that MOU that I'm referring to would be with the Gaysburg Area Rec Authority, with Transitions Healthcare, with Omega Healthcare Services, what's Happy's part in this going to be, what's the Historical Society's part. That MOU then allows us to go in and apply for a grant with DCNR. The other thing they ask for, the second bullet there, is a trail maintenance agreement. Okay, if you build this trail, who's going to clear the debris off it, keep it clear, uh, down the road when you need to replace some asphalt or you need to replace some signs or fencing if it's necessary, who's going to do that work? So in addition to the on-site meetings that Chad and I had with uh, the Cumberland Township people, I visited with the township manager and the roads director supervisor and we talked about the maintenance and they are agreeable to doing that maintenance given certain conditions and when, one of which would be that Happy would probably pay for materials. So we're in the process of, of provi providing or developing the MOU for the easement and for the maintenance agreement. And of course, if we're successful, hopefully next April we can apply to DCNR for the grants and hopefully get some grants for some other organizations. And as Chad said, you know, this is a multi-year project. This is way down the road yet before you know, ground is ever broken. Um, but we've got to start somewhere. And uh, this is where we start. As Chad mentioned, uh, he has the trail study uh, that's nearly complete. We just have a few more edits to do. Uh, it'll go up on our website. And uh, I will continue to meet with the Cumberland Township people to keep them in the loop as we go through the development of the maintenance agreement. So I think that's about all I have to say. Any, Patty, nothing? You okay. covered it nicely. Any other Thank questions? Uh, I don't have a question, but I do want to say thank you for your efforts on this. I'm sure Ms. Lawson has communicated to you that when we learned the Historical Society was leaving town, joining a long, long list of assets that are leaving Gettysburg, we were, I think, all pretty upset about that, and we really pushed the Historical Society to invest in something like this. I think it's very important to the residents of Gettysburg, particularly our low-income residents um, who should still be able to avail themselves of these facilities even if they don't drive. Uh, I just want to express my gratitude. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Anyone else? Any other suggestions or like it just the way it is? Faster and cheaper. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Always. I thought I was surprised actually by the cost. I thought it was going to be higher. Uh, you know, um, well, just wait. And this is, this is really important because I think I, I mentioned this before, but sure the that 40 miles an hour to 25 miles an hour, what makes it even more perilous is that people who are driving into town from outside of the borough, they're looking ahead to Lincoln and then you look at that light. And when they see that light is still green, they step on the gas and gun it. And that area from like Howard Avenue or Howard Street in through town is, I mean, they're, they're gunning it to go. So to, to have that speed limit dropped earlier, but before um, they get to transitions, before they get to the historical society is important because people are just gunning to try to get in there and make that green light, you know. So it's, it's dangerous. If I could add one other comment to that. When we had the public meeting and we had some residents who live on that side of Carlisle Street on the west side, they welcomed the idea of you know a, a wider path with a strip with trees because they know it's going to look better. There's going to be lights. It's going to look better. It's going to be, have a calming effect on traffic. And they were very much in favor of it. it surprised me a little bit. Point of clarification. No decorative streetlights. No decorative streetlights. Yeah, excuse me. So that the cost, and maybe part of the reason why it's not as expensive as right. you might have thought, is there right. is no electrical component to okay. what we propose. Just the trees at this point. Right. It, it could they could be added in that grass strip, but we aren't we aren't currently proposing okay. them because right. that would significantly <coughs> increase the price. Right. Yep. Yes, it would. I think it would be. Um, I hope that Cumberland is definitely going to help out with this. But I also uh, know that the Adams County Historical Society, as we've seen in the last two years, really knows how to raise money. Yes, indeed. And uh, having them as a partner for, for some of this would be very helpful. Because it's going to behoove them, as well as us. But they know how to raise money. Yeah, I mean, their facility is the destination. So Correct. It's only going to help them. 
I would have hoped prior so to they, this. I'd but... really hope for, I'm hopeful that they that that board will agree that they have to uh, be a great partner with this fundraising effort to make that happen. Yeah, I mean, I would like to think that that they would prioritize being able to walk to a facility like sure. that where you can throw a stone and hit the burrow. Right. I would hope so. All right, any other uh, questions or comments about the trail? All right, we're gonna go to public comment. I will start with Ms. Reisinger, who is here about 4th Street. So I have some handouts, but I only have 10. I'll just go down the line here. Folks. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Watch the cord. Watch the cord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I can put that okay. together. No problem. Thank you. Here's an extra if I can share with Chad, if you all. Uh, excuse me, I'm super nervous uh, being up here. <clears throat> Hi, my name's Jennifer Reisinger, and I live at 293 North 4th Street, <clears throat> right here in Gettysburg. Uh, I'm here to address the vehicle speeds on North 4th Street and in front of the Vita Charter School, which is highlighted in the orange map handout in front of you. As Gettysburg has grown, the section of road has become a true bypass with only a railroad crossing <clears throat> and a 90 degree bend in the road to calm traffic. Both the number of vehicles and vehicle speed has increased over se the last several years. So has pedestrian traffic, children on bicycles, pets playing in yards. A driver staring at their phone should not be able to zip by a kid riding his bike on a sidewalk at 40 miles per hour. Currently, Vita Charter School does not have any school zone speed limits. James Getty Elementary has school zone signage and a 15 mile per hour speed limit before and after the school. Lincoln Elementary has a permanent 50 mile per hour speed limit and a stop sign. A mother who signed this peti petition <clears throat> told me that it was often dangerous to walk her daughter across East Broadway on the way to Vita Charter. Although the speed limit is 25 <coughs> miles per hour on 4th Street, police allow a 13 mile per hour grace for citations. This means vehicles may legally travel in front of Vita Charter going 38 miles per hour even when school is starting and letting out and young children are coming and going. There are no truck signs posted on this section of road. What does this mean? Is this for semis or is it for delivery trucks? This is important for us as citizens to know what this signage means. The map in your folder shows results of two traffic studies that were conducted and compare the traffic volume on North 4th Street and traffic on East Broadway across Old Harrisburg Road. So Bob and I did this traffic study ourselves twice. Both studies revealed that traffic on North 4th Street was almost 50% higher than traffic on that section of Broadway, which recently had two speed calming humps installed. And for what it's worth, every citizen except one that was asked to sign this petition did. Many told their own stories of speeding drivers causing unsafe conditions. We, the residents of North and North 4th Street and in front of Vita Charter are very interested in a cost effective approach to address this issue. If additional traffic studies need to be conducted, maybe we could enlist a volunteer force of residents to assist. Possible solutions for your consideration. Maybe a, not maybe, a three-way stop sign at North 4th Street and Barlow Street. This may be the best way to minimize cost and maximize calming of the traffic speed speeds as Barlow sits almost right in the middle of this unsafe stretch of road. Incorporate school zone speed limit signs, speed limit at Vita Charter School. Conduct research on no truck signage to see if the box trucks and delivery trucks are legally 
allowed to cut through, even though no truck signage is already in place, installation of speed humps. Uh, and so thank you very much for listening to my concern. And so that I'm Jen and Bob Anderson. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Public comment. All right, I'm Sarah Kipp. I live at 126 Baltimore Street in the borough, and I am on the Borough's Planning Commission as a member, and I'm also serving as Getty, or sorry, as Happy's president currently, which I did disclose on my financial statement, even though I don't get paid for serving on the Happy Board or for serving on the Borough's Planning Commission. But I wanted to thank you all tonight for spending so much time discussing and thinking about all these infrastructure um, ideas around bicyclists and pedestrians and traffic. And I just wanted to touch a little bit on the Racehorse Alley. I think I'll be repeating what some ideas were said earlier tonight. But I just wanted to get, maybe get you to think about it a little bit differently. Um, I live on Baltimore Street, as I said. I work at the Ag Center. I frequently go to the post office for work. And so you better believe I use that alley all the time, either on my bike or driving both directions. Um, I, you know, so if that alley was changed in any way, I absolutely would feel inconvenienced that I could no longer drive on that alleyway in both directions. But I think that's absolutely what you need to do is to discourage people from doing so. Um, I'm not a traffic engineer or a transportation planner, but I think you've all probably heard things about how the more infrastructure you provide to vehicles, you don't actually end up alleviating traffic, you just create more demand and you, know, and you encourage people to drive more. Um, so that alleyway, as someone mentioned before, it's not, shouldn't be used as a bypass. None of our alleyways should. I, you know, I live on an alley, on Legion Alley. I have a parking spot there. People don't actually use it that much. I, don't, I feel like I don't really have that much conflict on Legion Alley because if you had two cars passing, you'd have to make space between two brick walls, and you can't do that on a lot of our alleys here. That alley is used by so many cars because it actually is sort of unusually wide. So I don't, I'm not gonna recommend which route you should take, but I want you to think about trying to pick the choice that actually makes it as inhospitable as possible for cars and creating the most use for bicyclists and pedestrians. And by doing that, by creating a space for bicyclists and pedestrians where they feel safe, you'll encourage more people to bicycle and walk, and then you'll be, you will be getting cars off the roads. So, um, Good luck making that decision. There's a lot of choices, and even among the happy board, we're not unanimous about what the best option would be. But I think if you, you know, discard the idea of trying to keep that route as it currently is used for, for cars, then we can think about how to make it a place for bicyclists and pedestrians. And I think that's all I wanted to say. Um, yeah, thanks for all your work, and I'm so sorry that I waited until the last minute, and now it's a very long meeting for you all, so thanks. Okay. Public comment. Scott English, property and business owner at 6668 West High Street. I've given you a copy of what I'm going to read, but I just wanted to share this with folks. Um, 91 years ago, a 55-year-old pastry baking carpenter named Carl Rooney from Baltimore Street in Gettysburg purchased the old haunted house on the corner and took a chance by turning it into a motel for tourists, the motel tourist home. Bringing life back to a rundown, uninhabitable property with a caved in roof through adaptive reuse. Carl's wife, Isabel, upon hearing the, the sheriff's sale purchase, she replied to him and said, Oh, that old place. Little did Carl and Isabel know that 30 years later, when President Eisenhower retired to Adams County, he and his wife, Mamie, would become customers of theirs for clothing repair and alteration needs. I don't know if my, if my great grandparents had permits to do that, but they did it. On one occasion, the Secret Service came to the Gaysburg Academy property and requested that my great-grandmother, Isabel, come with them to the Eisenhower farm and tend to clothing emergency that the president was experiencing, to which she replied, quote, if the general needs his clothes repaired, he'll come see me. <laughs> the Secret Service promptly left and returned with the president about 15 minutes later. It's stories like these that I want to share and open the property up to and share with the public. 
Let's celebrate the history of Ward 3 and the Gaysburg Academy as an event venue. I've also provided two maps, one outlining the proximity of more than 80 Ward 3 residents to support the use of the Gaysburg Academy as an events venue. I walked around, introduced myself, and spoke to the residents about the specifics of what I'm proposing and bringing vitality back to our community. The second map also identifies proximity of current and former businesses in the area. The Gaysburg Academy is the perfect historic social gathering platform to bring people together in an extremely historic part of our town. <clears throat> Let's celebrate the history of Ward 3 and the Gaysburg Academy as an event venue. One of the most critical components of the zoning text amendment for events venue in any zoning of any of the zoning districts affected is the lot size requirement, a minimum of a half acre. Some have suggested that an events venue could pop up next to any residence in the borough. Quote, the circus is coming to town and it could be right next to you. This is just not true. Event venues are not permitted in R1 and R2. This borough council has worked tirelessly over the past 17 months and has held 35 public meetings crafting an ordinance that protects property owners with restrictions that include minimum lot size, hours of operation, side yard setbacks, screening, and of course, all of the in-place existing ordinance to protect residents like noise restrictions and other code requirements with which businesses must comply. More specifically, with regards to the 2,000 square foot restriction, the Planning Commission discussed and voted unanimously, unanimously at their January 2022 meeting to recommend removing section 27-5A04.1 relating to the 2,000 square foot restriction on commercial uses in the Elm Street Overlay District. Councilman Chad Allen Carr mentioned the idea of a pilot program for events. Well, I did exactly that by inviting permitted ghost tours already on the sidewalk into my property. These tours are already happening with hundreds of people traversing through our neighborhoods every day and every night, every weekend. I merely invited them into the tour of the house and hunt outside on the grounds. I brought in over 500 people this past October 2022, every Friday and Saturday night from 8 p.m. to 11 p.m. These ghost hunters were both inside and outside and not one complaint about noise or parking, which I found out through a right to know request, was made to the borough. Existing borough noise and nuisance ordinances work and prove the Gaysburg Academy is a great event location. Let's celebrate the history of Ward 3 and the Gaysburg Academy as an event venue. The proposed event venue is supported and encouraged by both the 2019 Central Adams Joint Comprehensive Plan suggested downtown core and the 2008 Elm Street program for Gettysburg plan. The Gettysburg Academy functioning as an event venue is seen by a former manager of the Gettysburg Elm Street program as exactly what the Elm Street program was all about and is all about. These current in-place plans were reviewed by Adams County Planning Office, the Borough Planning Commission, and the most important participant, you, the taxpayer. Through many public meetings and public discussions, these plans were adopted by council. The Gaysburg Academy, built as Adams County's first public school, was destined for better things, to bring people to our neighborhood and share in its history. I have lived in the Ward 3, I support Ward 3, my neighbors and, res and I respect their privacy and fellowship. People are proud to live in Ward 3, and I'm a proud to be part of Ward 3, and want it to continue to thrive. Working together to build better bonds and build a be get better Gettysburg. Support this zoning text amendment, please, and help the Academy survive another 210 years. Let's celebrate the history of Ward 3 and the Gettysburg Academy as an event venue. You're all cordially invited to my next open house, which is April 25th from 5.30 to 7. That's tomorrow. Thank you again very much for working with me over the last 17 months on trying to get this done. Thank you. Public comment. All right. If there is no yes. Is it appropriate for me to ask a question of the last speaker? I want to avoid much of a back and forth, but you can ask a I question. I just have a direct yeah. question. Mr. English, I, I enjoyed the anecdote about your great-grandmother, Isabel. I think I would have enjoyed meeting her. And so if I can be so, cookie. I'm sorry? She was a very tough cookie. Yeah. Well, so if I could take a page out of Isabel's book, if I can be so bold to ask you, one thing that hasn't been addressed in, in the months leading up to this, and we will be voting next month, I am curious, because um, it has been raised, the for sale sign that's on your property, what, what is meant for that? Does that mean that um, you're not really that interested in the event, having the event venue, or I don't understand what that is. I'm very interested in having an event venue. That's why I... Um, Part of the plan that I bought my three brothers out mm -hmm. and, bought and purchased the right. property. So what um, is the what is this, the for sale what, sign meaning? 
the bottom line is I need to explore options. I'm sorry? I need to explore options uh -huh. for the property. Okay. And if, um, you know, at the beginning of this process, for many reasons, I decided to go through a process and work with the borough instead of just, you know, let's ask for permission instead of asking for forgiveness and just starting to use the property as I thought saw fit and waiting for the borough to come out and say, hey, you can't do this. So I think I'm going through the right process, applied for the zoning text amendment. So and what do you mean by, so what is this for sale sign doing up there then in terms of an option? How does that figure into this, your planning? If at the end of this, the borough determines that I cannot do event venues and utilize that side yard that's attached to the property, mm -hmm. as Mr. Lawver so accurately pointed out, I could just sell it unless somebody put up a three-story building. I, you know, I don't want to do that. There's a lot of history of the property. That side yard was used as a burial ground during the battle as the building was used as a hospital, but I need to explore options. And I've had 27 different people that are currently interested in purchasing that lot and or the entire property, but that's not what it's about. I'm very interested. My desire is to utilize it as it is currently approved as a bed and breakfast vacation rental in the borough but I would also like to engage the community more and have events there. Um, uh, we were just talking about potentially having a, a dog fashion show and you know, open the property up, not charge for it, but then have benefits go to the Forever Love and the SPCA, but use the property as a format to have as a platform for people in the neighborhood to come back and celebrate the community. But as a business person and an investor in the property, I think I need to keep my options open. So I did put a for sale sign up to um, determine the amount of interest in purchasing a lot. And it turns out there's a lot of interest purchasing a lot that's two blocks from the square in Gettysburg. Okay. Is it two separate lots? No. It so would you'd have, have to be to sub go through a subdivision process. Correct. Okay. Which I've explained to the folks interested in buying it, that would be their responsibility. Okay. Thank you. All right. Any other public comment? All right. If not, we are adjourned.